when we talk to a client for the first time or, or a partner, we go through a series of fundamental questions. The first being, what do you want to achieve? What does success look like? And I think a lot of people try and do digital because they think it's a piece that they need to have in their ecosystem. And I think that that is both true and also treacherous because just doing digital for the sake of having it is not a good reason to do something digitally. The reason to do something digitally is because you think you can achieve success as a result of that. And so we need to talk that through so that everyone understands the expectations. The second part of this is that we ask people what they believe the key challenge to engage in audiences. So from a creator's perspective or from a producer's perspective or a broadcaster or a distributor, um, you probably know the bigger challenges that you have. And so if you can inform us of those from your perspective, we're going to be more successful at, at, at overcoming those challenges. And, and also some of the things we like to do is just get inside the head of the people we're working with to understand, is there a strategy that you want to emulate? Is there something that you've seen that you want to achieve um, in a similar way? So then we go through some of the more uh, logistical uh, pieces like what is your experience with digital because I think different people have different uh, fluencies and you can quickly get into this morass. I, it's, it's interesting because I'll use the example of the word development. So in traditional media development is the early stages of a project. Uh, it's getting it up to, up to the place where you're going to go into production. In digital, development is the actual programming of the project. It's You're deep into production at that point. I've literally had I've seen it happen where people are having conversations for days about development and one group of people is talking about one part of the project and another group of people is talking about a complete separate part of it. And in order to create that fluency, we need to understand what your experience is. The demographic and target market is really important to us because um, digital is one of the purest ways to segment people and to understand segmentation. It's one of the most trackable. And if we don't get clear in our demographic, we're, chances are we're going to miss, miss our opportunity. Um, are there potential concepts, past concepts that have been floating around, something that was open at one point and then got closed for some reason? We need to know that so we don't go down that avenue again. Or if there's a potential concept that works, let's drive on that because we're going to get buy-in quicker and we're going to get everyone down the road on it. Um, are there design considerations, references? If you have a DP or an editor engaged and you have something like a sizzle reel or a tone book, um, we can use that and, and build off of that. And then fundamentally as well, are there additional marketing pieces that are going to go in market that are already planned? Because what we do is just one part of a, a bigger pie and, and it can't be disjointed from the rest or it will fail. So we need to understand what are the other pieces of that pie in order to be able to tie it in and integrate. And then finally, just there's some logistical concerns that we have, um, timelines, budget, technical considerations. For instance, if you have a broadcaster engaged like Super Channel, are we going to have to actually integrate into their framework for their website? Are we going to have to do pieces that, if we find out too late down the line, are going to degrade what we build? So let's get ahead of that and make sure we understand what we have to do. And I think in film, you have a unique challenge, although in television it's becoming more of an issue, um, of personality. So. One of the things that we've learned the hard way is that we need to understand who are the personalities involved in this project from the beginning so that we can make sure we get buy-in and we have all the stakeholders at the table at once. So an example is um, you know, you're dealing with the marketing department at Warner Brothers and you think you have every one of the stakeholders in the room uh, and you're nine months down the road, you've gotten every approval along the way and then it hits the agent of the star of the film. And that person wants to protect their talent, and as a result, they're not into something you've done, and now they kill the project. And so if we don't have that ahead of time, uh, and if you don't think about that ahead of time, especially with your stars, then it's gonna be potentially treacherous down the road. So I'm nearly done here. I just wanted to describe a couple things about where digital, I think, is really working from an entertainment perspective right now. Um, currently, I think television has matured in its model for a few reasons. Um, fundamentally, I think integration is now expected during production from TV producers and broadcasters. And, and 
and integration during production is the most critical element in success because it allows us to align early and make sure that we're, we're pulling those story hooks out along the way as opposed to trying to salvage them at the very end. Um, one of the unique elements of broadcast is that the audience is already participating on second screens and multiple screens while they're watching television. They may not be participating with your content, but it's an opportunity to put content in front of them that they can do in, in a paired way. Um, digi digital audiences are able to engage in a meaningful way and fundamentally change or affect the narrative on television. It's a difficult thing to achieve, but it's possible. Uh, and then social conversations and influence can, uh, can actually affect the audience appetite and broadcasters and producers can see that along the way and actually manipulate their show as a result. Where that is probably most evident is in factual and reality. Um, we did the Big Brother Canada site uh, and, and game and live streaming and everything and, and because that show is literally shot while it's airing, which is pretty unique, we're able to take the digital extension and actually affect the narrative. So in this season of Big Brother, the audience actually brought back from, uh, from eviction the eventual winner of Big Brother and fundamentally changed the game. Um, with respect to a narrative or a more uh, fictional narrative, we worked on a show called Continuum, uh, which is on sci-fi in the US and, and showcase here, where we actually created a parallel narrative using television characters. Uh, I'll, I'll show you the video, and then if anyone has any questions, you can. For the second season of Continuum, we decided to do something really interactive and cool for the fans, something that expands the show mythology and universe for them. Engaging the audience into a political discussion and debate about the pros and cons of both sides of the debate. One side is Kira's law enforcement allies, and the other side is liberating. We only get 44 minutes to tell our episode stories on the broadcast version. And this way we can actually get into things that are going on that we're not able to put into the main body of the broadcast show. We produced a series of six second Vine videos that uh, fans could explore and choose between one side or another. It will affect the outcome of the show. The digital extensions are going to be a rewarding experience because it'll get into things that you probably are somewhat aware of but that go a little further than the show does. Continuum has such a rich universe and a deep mythology around it, and how cool is it that you can be a part of the way that that fictional narrative takes place? So because the show is running for uh, 13 weeks, we actually have the ability to engage the audience week after audience week after week and then use their interaction to actually change the ending of the show. So we were able to shoot two endings of the television show with the producers and depending how the audience interacted and voted, we actually showed one of two endings and then start, we'll start season three off of where that ended. Um, so where film I think is differing just fundamentally is um, that integration during production, particularly from cast and crew is more difficult and celebrity is a really difficult part of this blend. Um, if any of you guys have worked on a project with a big star, it's, you know, it's very difficult to get them on board um, unless you get in early and you build a relationship. Um, audiences aren't going to participate during your film, and frankly, they shouldn't be because they're in a the theater typically. Um, and audiences can't really have a meaningful effect on the narrative, at least not easily. Um, now, there's, there's potential ways to do that if you if you separate a theatrical release from a potential television broadcast later and you thought about that early enough but it, it tends to be much more difficult and and just the structure of film is much more difficult to do that within um, the other part of it is that the execution of films is much longer and one of the things that I think is and I'll talk about this again later but um, because digital is is very there's a there's a sweet spot of where something is new and trendy, but not so bleeding edge that nobody knows what to do with it. 
but it's innovative enough that there's something PRable about it or hookable about it. And those things move quickly and change quickly. And like even releasing Continuum on Vine in April, you know, by June, Instagram had 15 second video. And frankly, I would have way preferred to do 15 second videos than six second videos from a narrative perspective. We were already broadcasting at that point. So just that three month window could have made a much bigger difference in the ability of that narrative to be told. So keeping in mind that length of time, you know, if you start early and you're going to be 18 months out from a release, you really have to think about how you're going to execute down that line and keep flexi keep yourself flexible enough to be able to change and iterate. Um, and then social conversations, you know, they're, they're interesting, but I don't think, um, I don't think they're as fundamental to success just because of, of the timeline of how things get released. So I'm going to, um, to step back and somebody's going to pull this podium off of here and uh, I'm going to let Katya talk about this project specifically and then we're going to go through some some ideas and directions that came up from from discussion. And are these live? Is this live? Yeah. Can you hear? Excellent. So as we do this, thank you. Thank you very much, James. And I know it was a late night for most people last night, but this one will wake you up. Um, this is actually, I think, perhaps one of the most current um, conversations that can be had for feature film, because there isn't anybody in this room, I don't think, that hasn't been asked lately, well, you know, what is the feature, what it, what it, what it makes a feature film as opposed to something that is longer format in a, on a smaller screen. And I think the real question that James is getting to is not so much what makes a feature film, but the opportunity of audience. And whether you're doing a large screen feature film or a television series, it's about connecting with your audience. So where are the opportunities? And that is what he and Katja are going to start with taking her project. Now, uh, Katja is a producer who's worked in broadcast with Arte in Germany and is now part of a production company that produces and develops and she's got several features in development and they have chosen Nearly Dead as one to actually explore what, what can she do now as she's at going into that financing and developing process to be thinking about how to connect with the audience and how to use the kind of tools that James has been exploring in multiple platforms to help get there. So whenever you're ready, and I then, we didn't really properly, I mean, I think our other panelists probably need very little introduction, but they are going to interact and jump in with questions for the two from their own background, and we invite you to do the same. Marguerite Piggott, you all have probably met with as, as uh, the head of creative development for Super Channel. Um, she has a long history in programming, both with the Toronto Festival um, and now with Super Channel in both features and series, so she's crossing over with those questions all the time. She also, before that, was uh, in uh, feature film distribution with Odeon and then Alliance and has been responsible for working with a lot of Canadian talent. So she comes at, and she also has her own company, consultancy company, working with a talent, a talented writers and directors at early stage development on their projects. So she's very interested in where this is all going. Um, and someone I just met this morning, Brian Wadeen from Vancouver, who, for all you gamers out there, spent 12 years at Electronic Arts. So he's a bit of a, he comes at this from the computer programming background and then ran teams at EA. And then he's a co-founder and COO of Cinecoop, which you may all know from its quite, I would say, large presence in the landscape in the last year with their deal with Cineplex to run an incubate accelerator for young filmmakers for financing and developing their films. And I think it was at Banff you announced your first yep. uh, winner who gets a million dollars and uh, and a guaranteed screen on Cineplex Wolf across Cop. the country. Mm -hmm. Wolf Cop, yes. Yep. And you're so again, the panel has comes at this from deep background, but also a really inherent interest in what we're doing. So over to you, James, with Katja, and then we'll jump in with questions. And from you, I think there's a mic possibly in the room if, uh, if people want to jump in. Thanks. Yeah, so I'll just let Katya explain the film. Yeah, I tried to make it quick, quick and dirty. <laughs> so um, uh, my project is called Nearly Dead. And um, I mean, it's a working title, but it reflects quite appropriate what, this, what the film is about. It's about life and death, and in particular about this um, very exciting uh, transition state between these two elements. So we're telling the story of a young woman, her name is Sarah, and uh, she has an accident uh, which puts her in this state of transition and um, this allows her in a way to have a much clearer or to get a much clearer idea of, an, of a nightmare which she's having for most of her life. 
it's a nightmare where she sees a young woman chained and terribly tortured in a dark cellar and um, this near-death experience in a way um, leads Sarah to Berlin where she finally uh, solves a true crime which has happened in, uh, at the east-western border, border of Berlin during the Cold War times. And, um, it is a psychological thriller with a strong note, a strong tone of, of mystery in it, and we are uh, quite early in the financing stage. We have talked to a couple of people, and there was a good response. We tried to set it up as a German-Canadian co-production, and um, already have a German director attached. His name is uh, Christian Schwacho, and he just recently won the uh, Fopresky Award in, at Montreal Film Festival. So. Um, and we have a very solid script which already has allowed us to have some really interesting German actors attached so far. They are in films like The White Ribbon, Downfall or Monuments Man and we're just approaching right now um, Diane Kruger for, um, for the leading role and uh, yeah, I hope when she jumps in um, that everything will fall into its place in a way. Um, Regarding this uh, digital strategy, uh, I must admit I had I have no clue about digital strategy so far. So that's why I'm really curious about to hear um, on the one hand um, if it really makes sense to have a digital strategy uh, on my project or not. Um, what could be an approach, especially on the narr narrative level? And of course, I mean uh, from a point of view um, as a producer, um, I would like to know how much. Uh, what amount of money I have to invest and what time I have to spend on it. So that's in a way it. Cool. Um, so I, maybe I'll just give a quick description of why uh, I picked this film from a few that were uh, proposed. And I think, um, you know, one of the things I asked Laura was uh, to find a film and producer who actually wanted to collaborate. And I think that you know, what I said earlier about ticking off the digital box, it's not a good reason to do digital and it's really not a good reason to work together. Um, and it will be a nightmare at some point because it won't really be what you want to do and, and it will be a burden. And I think when it comes to collaboration, it's really about getting excited about the opportunities. And, and uh, you know, I think um, just quickly, not everything needs a big digital strategy. It just doesn't work like that and and uh, you know I think I think a presence in digital is probably mandatory at this point you know you, you kind of need to have a website you probably need to think about how social media is going to impact what you're doing but the scale of that is really up for debate and I think um, you know with respect to this film g genre films uh, psychological thriller stuff with rich narrative territory gives us and the audience more ability to dive into that narrative versus something like uh, romantic comedy. Um, you know, that's not necessarily true of all things and, and there's no sort of, there's no one way to do any of it, but um, typically, you know, in digital, a romantic comedy or a, or a comedy will trade off its stars versus the narrative. And um, for us, you know, this film had elements of shock, surprise, suspense that could be taken to the next level digitally. Beyond this, I thought, there really was great intrigue and mystery enabling the potential to peel back multiple layers, which is sometimes rich territory. So before I go into specific elements, I want to sort of contextualize what I see right now as sort of the, the three key avenues and ways that digital is marketing and helping film. So there's what I would call pure display or socially integrated marketing. This is really can be a very baseline presence and it can also extend a little bit further. And I'll show an example of sort of a best practice in this. Um, with respect to the second extending the story world, you know, the term transmedia, it's really, it's how long, we were discussing this earlier, how long is a piece of string? It can be crazy and intense. It can be, you know, um, Batman Begins, or it can be, uh, it can be something a little bit more straightforward and linear. Uh, and last, I think productizing the brand, um, which can also monetize through games or apps, that's something that's happening more and more, and I think there's specific reasons to do that, and I think there's a lot of reasons not to do that as well if you're just purely trying to market something. So when I talk about display, um, what I'm really talking about is a really cool web presence that potentially has social integration. So this, this film, Kings of Summer, is sort of an indie film distributed by a studio. What's really cool about the, pro the project is that it's completely built out of Tumblr which is a, a social media blogging platform that's very simple, like 
simpler than WordPress. Uh, it's huge within teens and tweens. Um, and so every piece of this site, from the top image to each of those headlines, is actually a piece of social content that upon rolling over it and clicking on it can be pushed out to Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, uh, and Tumblr. And ultimately, it enables anything on the site to be social. So it's not just about putting a Facebook button at the bottom that, that pushes a URL. It's about enabling the audience to tell the story for you of the things that are interesting to them. And I think it's just a really elegant and simple way to do um, something digital. When I look at best practices for extending the story world or transmedia, I think probably the, the best execution I've seen in the last little while was um, the transmedia plan for uh, Prometheus. So this is obviously Ridley Scott, it's a big picture, but um, what I thought was brilliant about it is that they, they took Wayland Industries, which is the sort of industrial complex within the film, and they really blew it out. So they actually built a website for Wayland Industries. They created sort of a linear narrative that was outside of the film about how Wayland had sort of started uh, mining the universe, essentially. They even went as far as to create a TED Talk that took place 80 years before the narrative of the film and took the main character who sets up Prometheus as a young man and enables him to describe the mission that they're then going to launch from, from the film. Um, when I look at productizing or extending the brand uh, and specifically monetization, I think a lot about um, gaming and apps because that tends to be the place where people go. So on the left, uh, you see uh, Temple Run Brave, which is basically a white labeled version of Temple Run that they did with the animated film Brave from Disney. And Disney's doing a lot of white labeling of existing games. It's a smart play because building a game, as I'm sure uh, everyone at EA knows, is a huge undertaking. And to try and invent a game for a film is a huge undertaking, so why not adapt an existing game that's very successful and, and put your brand on top of it? The second one is uh, the Super 8 app, which uh, is a pay to purchase 99 cent app and it basically turns your cell phone into a Super 8 camera. Um, and the third one is an app, a very small app we did. Uh, budget was about 25 grand. It was, um, we work with a, a producer, an actor named Adrian Grenier from Entourage. Uh, and he produced a film called How to Make Money Selling Drugs, which is like a parody of uh, how easy it would be to become a drug kingpin. Um, but in so doing kind of reflected the archaic nature of the drug war in the US. So we built this little app that allows news to be fed in and then people to create um, their own version of public perception around news stories. And as a result, we're aggregating it. So I brought in uh, the Columbia uh, School of Journalism in Tribeca and the DPA, which is the Drug Policy Alliance in New York. And we all collaborated on this little app and built a product for the film. So it helps to market the film and it also extends it beyond that. And um, and I think Marguerite was saying earlier that as well, uh, it also provides a ton of data for us that potentially is able to be used in other formats. Um, there's some hybrid approaches, and I'm going to get through this very quickly, but one of the things I think if you don't have a lot of availability on set and you have a director who's really engaged, like Danny Boyle did this amazing interview project for Trance um, that gives users the opportunity to hear Danny Boyle talk about the film, give his perspective, and then dig in through this interactive timeline into content in a really, really structural but, but immersive way. Um, another film, Sound of My Voice, did a really amazing execution where they actually released the first 12 minutes of the film online where the narrative is actually broken up into points. You can watch the film in the first 12 minutes completely linear, um, or you can also sort of click on these hotspots within the, the timeline that reveals more context about scenes. It does an amazing job of, of showing you enough of the film that you actually want to go to the theater, given that they've released half of the film or a quarter of the film. Um, so just quickly going into initial directions, um, you know, I. I want to just say that we haven't had a ton of time to work together. <laughs> so I'm calling these directions because these are not fully baked concepts. And this is really where the process starts. And I'm going to talk, talk about what would happen next after this. But the idea and how we work is that we want to try and provide directions, different avenues to go down using context and reference, and then enable that to create a discussion that allows everybody at the table um, from a filmmaker all the way through distributor and actor or whatever, whoever the stakeholders are, to, to provide feedback and then for us to refine those directions and actually provide a plan. So we had a phone call. We've gone back and forth on email. Um, one of the directions that came up was this idea of Cold War 
Berlin and how cool it would be to sort of explore Cold War Berlin through the lens of the film. Yeah, I think probably it's not the priority, but um, because <laughs> we're, um, I mean, we're going to tell or giving these pictures more, you know, in flashbacks, and it's not most of the time. I mean, the the film really takes place in the present, so. Um, but I feel it could be a cool idea, you know, just uh, because it's very, always interesting to people, you know, having this historical aspect of the, of a city and uh, combined with this, I think. Everybody knows Berlin, so um, I thought this could probably, yeah, be of interest to some audience as well. And just vibing off that, you know, when I when I heard that idea, I immediately thought, um, you know, lo location specific stuff. Exploring a city is often difficult because you have to be there to to really contextualize it. So one of the things that I was thinking based on this early idea was how cool would it be to create an app or a site where you could actually like hold your iPad or phone over wherever you are and it transforms that to Cold War Berlin and then you're able to reveal content based on that. So it takes people out of the context of their home and brings them into the real world and engages them in a way that they want to go down the road of, of watching this film. Uh, an interesting thing you could do there as well is um, lots of people have old photos and stuff like that so you could just reach out and start creating kind of a historical photo journal for that that era of Brazil and just make that as kind of part of the celebration of that. Um, so direction number two was something that struck me immediately upon reading the synopsis. I haven't, haven't read the script but um, just the idea that the nightmares are such a prevalent piece of this and they're sort of, they, they lead the character down the road of the, of the story. So for me, um, you know, anything that's provocative, anything that's spiky is gonna, is gonna have the best chance of breaking out digitally. So for me to, to try and pull out some of these nightmares or some of the visualizations from these nightmares and then distribute them, distribute them through social or through other channels, um, might enable an audience to get intrigued by the concept of the story and then bring them in. And how we would do that is, is really up for debate at this point, but I think the idea of extending the narrative from the perspective of nightmares, it also gives us the most flexibility, frankly, to produce additional content that might not screw up the, the narrative of the film. And I think that's one of the things that becomes really something that can become contentious in building these things is like, who, who's going to make new content and how is that going to happen and is that going to disrupt the, the linear 90 minute narrative. Um, so these kind of provided a, a way for us to, to branch off. Interesting that you're also, when we heard that you're going out to a star like Diane Kruger, you're not, your ideas so far are not depending on her agents approving her involvement because they're surrounding the project. Yeah, and I mean for us, our biggest priority is just to get good work done. Uh, I hate the politicking of this. So if I can avoid getting us into these mor morasses of like endless phone calls and conversations with agents, uh, I'm gonna do anything I can to do that. I think we're all in the same yeah. camp there. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, but okay, so on this idea, just on those couple of directions, and we get it, they're just directions, this is an early conversation. On a pragmatic level, were you to explore this, both in terms of either an app or the, you know, in the whole uh, Cold War Berlin, when does it start? Who does it? What's the relationship that you would have going forward to, to develop this? And, and again, who pays for it? What does it cost? Sure. So, I mean, in an ideal scenario, we're engaged at a very early stage from a script level. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean we're like going to start, you know, putting people in your office and working 40 hours a week at that point. It just means that we're able to, to sort of be in touch from an early stage and, and, to, and to allow the ideas to incubate over the course of the narrative being developed. It also allows us to inject some ideas early and get them cleared before we potentially get into a time crunch. And it also allows us to potentially tee up times for us to integrate with production while you're shooting, which is critical to creating additional content in the most integrated way. Um, you know, we, we definitely work on a lot of projects where they're fully baked and they just come to us and they're like, help us solve this problem and you know it, we can do that like it's not impossible it just isn't as productive or effective to do that from a cost and timing perspective you know it really depends what you know when we built that tug of war app we built it in three weeks uh we have a good relationship with apple we were able to talk to our guy there who was able to push the submission process for us um knowing the importance of the film um 
you know, there's other projects that we've worked on for 24 months. Um, maybe not full time, but at different points. So it really can, can change and obviously the time to a certain extent affects the cost and the scale affects the cost. Um, you know, I said the tug of war app was about 25 grand. Um, we're doing stuff for, you know, studios that are fifth, that's 50 grand. We've done projects that are $1.3 million. You know, it really, it really can change, but the way to think about it is just, it's, it's time, it's materials, and it's, it's effort at the end of the day. So um, we, we bill on hours and, and that's just how it works. So the more we're gonna, t more time we're gonna put into something, the more it's gonna cost basically. Right, and, and how much do you intersect which, with the team? Because you talked about development meaning two different things for film producers who are developing scripts and then you who are developing a whole concept. At what point then do you, inter how much do you intersect with the team around the film, the director, the producer, the designers, the? As much as we can without being a burden. So I want to have as much contact as I can and get as much information drawn out, but I want to also take it away and then present something back in a professional, straightforward way that they can evaluate. And I think, um, and, then, and then go forward on hopefully or give us feedback that we can change. So there's a fine line between collaboration and being annoying. And uh, you know, you've got a film to make and that's your priority. And if we're, if we're impacting that in a negative way, then we're not doing our job. While at the same time, we need contact in order to be able to be successful, so. Marguerite or, or Brian, just in terms of the idea, the initial direction for Nearly Dead, any thoughts from you about how that might enhance what you would, your interest or how you could see that yeah. working? Sure, sure. Um, I think a good way for me to answer that question would be kind of to put it in context of how, you know, how I'm thinking about digital on behalf of Super Channel with regard to feature films. So um, obviously we've, it's something that we've been doing with regard to series, it's something we've been doing with regard to docs. Feature is different. I think it's uh, much more early days. Um, so we're all kind of learning on this. But I think, you know, for Super Channel, for any pay television network, our business model is walled garden. And you know, you don't get to see our pretty, pretty things unless you, you pay to get over the wall. This presents a marketing challenge. And we don't have a massive marketing budget. So we've got to figure out mm -hmm. ways to make our walls slightly permeable and to allow people to see a little bit of what's behind it. And so digital extensions are an amazing way of doing that for us. So I see it as, as potentially working as marketing for, for Super Channel and not just for the film. So the kind of film where we would be most likely to be excited about and support a digital extension would be the kind of film where it's like, oh, if the people who like that film will find a lot of the kind of stuff they like on Super Channel, then it makes sense to reach out to them. So for example, we have a really robust horror offering on Super Channel. And on the net, that audience is aggregated. There are touch points. It's like, well, you go here, you go here, you go here, and you've reached the people who are fanatics. And so you're building out your brand to people who, when they become aware of what's behind your wall, are going to subscribe and are going to stay, because we want sticky subscribers. So that would be kind of key to our strategy. So we'd be looking at this and we'd be kind of going, okay, do we have um, you know, is the audience aggregated on the net? Do we know that there are clear touch points where, where you can access them? Is that audience interested in a lot of the stuff that we offer? Um, and, and yeah, so that would kind of be the approach. With something like this, it's genre, so I would have picked it for exactly the same reason you did. Um, also, I think because it involves layers of mystery, solving crime, mm -hmm. nightmares, creepy nightmares, communist nightmares, whatever, um, I can, you can automatically picture digital extensions getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So my thoughts in terms of you know, that working really well for the film is I think, you know, okay, so it's a psychological thriller, so who's that audience? Okay, you know, a question I often ask myself, and I, I, um, uh, Tony Chinchata gave me this, is when I'm looking at a film, I'll ask myself, you know, who will stand in a lineup outside at night in January to see the movie? And you try to see the lineup, and that's, it's the same for the internet. You know, what sites are they on, blah, blah, blah. Who are they, what do they love? So when I see that kind of app, and I see the idea of the nightmares, and I know that that pro probably relates to, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Katya, the whole crime-solving thing in the film. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the nightmare is in a way one of the most important things of, of, of the film. Maybe you can just skip to, to the next one because I think this is the more, for, to me personally, the more interesting thing is that we talked about probably uh, creating a kind of a puzzle because uh, when our leading character is going to Berlin, she is in a way, you know, investigating and she is solving yeah. a true crime. So this, we both thought, would be a good idea to, you know, use as a one of these direction to you yeah. know attract people in a probably in a light way and i think the 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 difficult thing is to keep them and to, to you know to yeah. keep them attached and this could be a good uh, good idea uh, sure. to do I sure yeah. and i think i mean that's the kind of thing that appeals to that audience the peeling back the layers the puzzles so yeah absolutely i look at that and i'm like that's going to keep them engaged that's great and then in terms of iterating over a long period of time i think you know, the films that we, we would focus on for digital strategy aren't so much the big studio films that come to us through our Fox deals or, you know, whatever, because everybody already knows those films. That we don't need marketing push around those films. When they come to Super Channel and they're on our SVOD, all our subscribers see them and they perceive value, so everything's working for us there. It's the smaller films that will get either short theatrical releases or no theatrical releases that actually interest us more. Um, so anyway, I could see this kind of approach working working for those kinds of films. From from my standpoint, it's it's the uh, tapping into that audience early. So we, we have an advantage with Wolf Cop because um, uh, you know part of the reason we chose Wolf Cop is they already have an audience and fans behind it. Um, I didn't never knew where Wolf News existed, but apparently it does. Uh, we got invited to HowlCon, whatever that is. I'm a bit scared, and so, so it, it, it's it's like you said. There's these big communities of people that just passionately jump all all over that stuff. So you can tap into those communities, then that's great. So our our, our job uh, moving forward is going to be how do we continue to engage them continue to keep them involved because uh, when you get them involved early, now you've got nine months before the movie hits the theaters and another three more months before it gets in, into broadcast. So you want to keep them engaged and, and you can't do that by having a, trying to keep them excited every single day. Yeah. People start to get fatigued. So it's sort of, are there natural beats along the way that, that you can go and you say, okay, so we're going to run this kind of a campaign maybe around the, the you know, photo history of, of Berlin, you know, that, that time period. And then you do another one that's just focused on dreams and see how much people can scare each other just by describing their, their dreams or taking pictures or, 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 or scream art you could have. And even, even like only a handful of people would submit the art, but that 4% of the audience that submits the art, the other 90% of the people are... That's 96. The other 96% of the people are, are just going to be all over that and engaging and liking and showing and stuff like that. So, so you can kind of start create events and do stuff that leads up to the events, all leading up to the films. And then you'll find some members of the audience are really, really active. Uh, uh, and they've got lots of influence. You know, They talk, and people listen, and they retweet, and they share, and do all that sort of stuff. And so now you can, you can reach out to them and incentivize them to bring all their friends. You know throw a special party at the at uh, a particular theater in Berlin and and big red, red car and people love to go to events like that especially if they can dress up like their favorite nightmare cosplay <laughs> yeah. um, I, I was just gonna I just put a couple slides in just to show something that I thought was really interesting so uh, back in you know five six years ago um, there was this sort of 1990 rule of social media which was one percent are heavy contributors nine percent intermittently contribute yeah. and 90 percent are what are called lurkers um, now what's interesting with the evolution of Facebook and Twitter is that what you actually have is is a much higher percentage of intensive use and a much higher use of, of easy interaction because of things like like buttons and share buttons yeah. that are much simpler to engage with than the, the much more labor intensive um, sort of social of, of the past. Um, and, and, you know, and you know something about the people. If you meet someone at a bar and you ask them, you know, what, what's your age, where do you live, what do they get creeped out and think you're trying to, but, but all you have to do is get them to like, like you on Facebook and you have all that information right then and there anyway. And so, so when you want to activate them, you can activate them because people are amazingly open on Facebook. I've yeah, they are. definitely. Yeah. So I was just going to, uh, we should probably jump into some questions soon, but these are sort of what we would typically, the, the items that we typically do next. So collaborating further on story. Um, aligning the objectives against the logistics. So one of the things we like to do is to not tie those two things together too early. So tell me what you really want. 
uh, and then tell me how much you have, leave those two alone, and then when we get to an idea that we like, let's merge those together and see what we can do for what we have. Um, and then we refine based on those factors. So if, it's, if you have less than what it will cost to do X, then let's figure out how to do Y and make it for what, what works. Uh, once we agree in the approach and we agree to be flexible and update that based on how things are gonna change, then we start to move, at, move on and carve out time where we are either gonna embed somebody with your production or we're gonna come in at specific times that you can expect and schedule and that we can have uh, priority for. So I think, you know, one of one of my friends, uh, a guy named Ivan Asquith, is was the former head of digital at Lucas Arts. He's now uh, the embedded producer, transmedia producer on Veronica Mars. He's on set every single day, capturing media, capturing interviews, capturing whatever he's going to do. I, I don't really know what he's going to do, um, but I'm sure it's going to be awesome. And they wanted to do that because they funded themselves on Kickstarter. They had a responsibility to their fans. Other films are going to have much less need for that. So it's, it's nice to have somebody just come in when you need them. Um, and then al aligning the marketing plan with distributors or the studios, and then launch, watch, and iterate. I'll just leave this on. Um, but these are sort of principles that tend to work in general. Um, if anyone wants me to explain any of them, we can. But it's just, I think, what the last piece I would just say is I think now uh, it's much more about building a relationship with fans than it is about just trying to get them into this into the theater if you can build a relationship then they will become advocates for you and I think the most successful filmmakers and the most successful films have built audiences and similarly the most successful filmmakers who have raised money on Kickstarter for films haven't have a relationship with their audience you know the Veronica Mars guys have been maintaining their fan base for 10 years um, Spike Lee has a very specific fan base that he ties into and he gives them what they want when he's asking them for their support, you know, whether that's giving them a pair of Air Jordans or his Air Jordans for a thousand dollar donation or it's, or it's other elements, it's things that matter to that audience and it's incentivizing them in a, in a very specific way. And I think just lastly from an innovation standpoint, looking at filmmakers like J.J. Abrams and Fincher and Christopher Nolan, like these are people who Yes, they're massive directors now, and it's easy to sort of downplay the role they play now because they're so big, but they, they got big because they built that relationship with their audience and they created innovative ways for their films to break out of the masses. And that made all the difference in enabling them to have the specifics and the budget to be able to do what they need now. Great, great. And uh, are there any immediate questions or comments from the room? Yes, go ahead. Um, so, I mean, thank you for that. That's all really, really interesting information. I think that um, the um, extending the story world in television is simple and obvious and is working really well. And I think for directors like J.J. Abrams and Christopher Nolan, where they're franchises and there's a body of work, that's also very obvious. For a small independent film or a medium-sized independent film where the film is a once-off, and let's say it's a genre like drama, um, or even the psychological thriller. I mean, as we're talking about creating kind of images of Cold War Berlin and engaging people, that's a small number of people that are going to be engaged. And my question is about the cost and the effort of doing that versus just taking the money and spending it on traditional marketing or even digital marketing, as opposed to inventing new stories and new ideas. Can you comment on the, on the I guess, the worth of that for kind of a, an effort and money versus reward? Yeah, so there's... There's not going to be a silver bullet answer for that, and I'm not going to be able to provide you a multiple of dollars spent in sort of experiential digital marketing versus like paid ads on Facebook, for instance. Um, there's no question that doing something original and larger from an interactive perspective is risky. It just is. And you're, you're rolling the dice with doing that. You, you know what you're going to get from buying Google ads and Facebook and a one pager in the New York Times to a certain extent, you don't necessarily know what you're gonna do. The, the potential of it is that it breaks through. For smaller dollars, it actually creates a much larger groundswell. The risk of it is that it falls flat on its face and nobody cares. Um, and I think that that's why the strategy element up front is really the, the critical factor. And it's about getting buy-in and it's about iterating. And, and the reality of it is that no one thing is gonna be perfect out of the gate. It's going to be something that's a commitment to do both early and, and as you move through it. And, um, and I think that the more effort and thought and care and, and commitment that's put into something, 
ultimately has a much better chance of resonating and being successful. And I also think that these things tend to build. So if you can start early and you can start integrating and, and digesting and, and pushing out content and, and media up front, then you can build an audience that's rabid um, for that film. And I think, you know, there's, there's, um, there's lots, horror is a perfect genre to describe very, very small films like Paranormal Activity, which have done an incredible job of digital early stage marketing and really doing a, a good job of the long tail and pushing that through and creating a franchise out of it. You know, those films were made, uh, Insidious, another film, made very, very little money um, in Hollywood and, and, yet, and yet have gone way beyond expectations. Again, it's genre, so it's got a very specific fan base, it's got a very specific vertical to drive down, but I think, I think it's, it's, it can be a really amazing ROI, and it can be a terrible ROI. Is there, is there an age group? Because I know you're talking genre. In drama, I think we've all touched on is bingo, the toughest one to yeah. perhaps imagine this way. I think, Marguerite, you were... Yeah, I'd love to add. I mean, I, I mean, James James already made the point, but I mean, not every project is appropriate for a digital strategy. And certainly drama is a really, really tough one. And for me, it, it goes back to a few basic questions, and these questions apply... Uh, irrespective of how you're, you're marketing the film, whether it's theatrical distribution or, or totally traditional or whatever, but it's what's, what are the hooks and who's your audience? And you know, there's character-driven drama, like I think of a, a beautiful recent Canadian film that actually went on and did over a million dollars in the Canadian box office, which is a, a large number. Um, still mine, when you think about doing a digital strategy for that, it doesn't, it doesn't work hugely, although I do agree with you that with thought and care you can build audience, but it is, it is about ROI. Um, but with what, what are the hooks, I think, you know, look at some dramas like political dramas, um, like Bob Roberts or Wag the Dog or Primary Colors. I know I'm reaching back a few years. But the question for me is always like, where's the audience online? Is it easily aggregated? Can I point at a few spots? And it's like, well, if a hook is that there's all this political content, then can you, can you point at a few spots where an audience that shares the point of view of the film is going to aggregate? And, you know, yes, with those films, you absolutely can. So in those cases, because the hooks lead you to an easily identifiable audience on the web, that's a case where it's, it's a doable thing.